because they're bound over time. They cared. It is good company policy to care for your workers. If you care for the workers, the workers will care for your star- for your customers. It just makes so much sense. Even to the point, some years ago, there was, when I was in Thailand, and the in-flight magazine of Thai Airways, I got a, co- no, it wasn't the in-flight magazine, it was in Bangkok Post, sorry. There was an article about the Oriental Hotel in Bangkok. Probably the most famous hotel in Bangkok. It was not five stars, six or seven, like equivalent to the raffles in Singapore. The Oriental Hotel. It had just won a prize that year of the best hotel in the world. It beat everybody. Now that takes a lot to get the top hotel in the world. And they're interviewing the manager. What are your secrets? Why was it the best hotel in the world? He said, one of the things we've done over the last few years, we sent all our employees, from the concierge to the chefs to the the, uh, the cleaners, we sent all of our employers in a rot- rotation to a Buddhist monastery for a meditation retreat for one week. At the company's expense, we don't take this time off their holidays. The Oriental Hotel was sending all of their workers for a meditation retreat. And the interviewer, I think it was a Christian, said, are you trying to evangelize? Are you trying to make all your workers Buddhist? He said, no, it's nothing to do with that. It's just plain good business sense. We're in the hospitality industry. After the meditation retreat, I find my workers do not take so much sick leave. They're in good health. They're more sensitive because of the mindfulness which they develop. They're more sensitive to our clientele. And they have bigger smiles on their face. And that's hospitality. People like coming to our hotel. It's good business sense, he said. And that's why it got the best hotel of the year. So, when you go back to your company, you tell them, you should send everyone to a retreat under Ajahn Brahm at the company's expense. (laughs) Every year, and then your company will also get the company of the year award. Wouldn't that be great? And they pay you to come as well. That'd be even better. <laughs> and that was true. So this is actually that if you got the boss from hell, send them to someone like like me, or give them some dharma tapes. It's not in their interest to do things like that. Any other question? And if you've got you children, if you've got the mother and father from hell, they always say, "Do more homework. Do more homework. Come on." Then you take them to say, Daddy, Mummy, can we go and see Ajahn Brahm tonight? <laughs> and then your Mummy and Daddy from hell will become your Mummy and Daddy from heaven. And then because you've got such kind parents, you'd actually want to work harder and do more homework. Not because of fear, because of encouragement. Yeah, question, yes. Hi. you repeat that? How do you set ourselves? Free from hatred. Okay, look. If, why do you hate anyway? Because it's only because someone's upset you. And they've upset you, they've said something, they've done something in order to, to spoil your happiness. So why are you doing what they want you to do? They've said this terrible thing or they've done this awful thing to make you upset. And I would never do that. If someone calls me camel face, I'm not going to allow them to spoil my day. (laughs) Never let anybody control your happiness. They can say whatever they like, they can do whatever they like. I'm going to be happy in spite of what you do or what you say. Your happiness is your concern. If you hate somebody, you've lost the argument. You're a loser. 
So instead of hating, I just ignore. If, say in your relationship, your partner says these stupid things, sometimes they say those things to wind you up, to get a reaction, a negative reaction. Just ignore those stupid statements. If you ignore them, you don't even get upset, you don't acknowledge them, you don't argue, they call you camel face. I don't hear that. After a while, they'll stop saying it because they get no reaction. But if they say nice things, oh, you're just a beautiful girl, you're so nice you know, living with you, you're so kind, acknowledge that. Say, oh, thank you so much. Give them a hug, give them a kiss. You're so kind too. Because what you acknowledge, you reinforce. What you ignore, you suppress. This is how we actually control others, how we actually help them. Look, there was this one monk years ago who was such an angry monk. I found out later it was because he had migraines. That's actually why he got angry at everybody. And one day he got angry at me. What I was doing, I was washing my bowl after the meal and I was washing the little spittoon we used to have as well. And he came up to me and he looked at me and he said, Bramawangso, that's a filthy habit. But worse than that, I'm trying my best to be angry, but I'm not really used to it. Bramawangso, that's a filthy habit. <laughs> and everybody stopped. Because when you have, like, conf- it's very boring in a monastery. When you have, like, an argument like this, it's really exciting. <laughs> so everybody stopped. And of course, my first reaction was to look, well, I'm, what am I doing? I said, I've been doing this for, year, for, for months. Everyone else does the same. Why pick on me? Whenever someone shouts you like that, the first thing which comes up is self-justification. Why me? This is not fair. But at least I was wise enough to not go down that road. If I'd have stood up and say, you can't say that to me. Everyone else is doing this. Stop getting angry like this. I'd have just fed his anger. I'd have got angry myself. So instead, I used all of my willpower. I looked him up and I said, sorry. And then I turned around. And again, I was shaking with actually control. Because I didn't want to do this. I was going against my grain. I should have stood up to him. But what I did was much better. I went to the rag box picked up the rag and as I was going to that rag box I saw all the other monks, they'd stopped washing their bowls, they were watching me all the eyes were following me to the rag box <laughs> now is he going to get that rag box and tip it over this monk's head? what's he going to do? and I picked up a rag and I walked back and they followed me back and I started doing exactly what he said was wiping the spittoon with a rag and then I looked up at him and everyone looked at him, he went beet red He turned around and he went off. He tried to get me upset. I refused to get upset. And because of that, he never got angry at me ever again. He gets angry at other monks, but I'm one of his best friends. (laughs) And I was very proud and it was a very brilliant strategy. He got angry at me to try and embarrass me, to try and hurt me. And I refused to get hurt. Afterwards, he said, getting angry at Ajahn Brahm is like getting angry at a mountain. It's a waste of time. You waste of breath. You just get hoarse. Now, if you can do that, people don't get angry at you anymore. It's a waste of time getting angry at you. And it means you don't hate anybody. When you hate someone, you just got this terrible pain inside. It's burning. It separates you from other people. And one thing you can always notice, the people you hate, other people love them. It's strange, it was strange to me when I was a young man. How can anybody love such a B-A-S, you know know the rest of the word. (laughs) But they could. Because when I hate them, I could only see half of them, or part of them. And other people could see the other part of them, a part you can really love. Everybody who's the object of your hatred. We've got many, many friends who think they're wonderful. So the next time you hate someone, see what the other people see in them. 
the beautiful part. See the Buddha nature. When you see the Buddha nature in them, then you can forgive them. The first part of forgiveness is to see something in the person you hate which is worthy of forgiveness. If Mr. Bush could see something in Osama bin Laden which is worthy of forgiveness, then it would be the end of the problem. But sometimes we demonize people and think they're all bad, there's nothing redeeming in them. Now in Buddhism everybody has got Buddha nature. Everybody can be forgiven. And it's a much more beautiful world when we have forgiveness rather than hate. So free yourself of hate. If you think that person doesn't deserve to be forgiven, if you think they need to be punished, you do not need to be the punisher. You do not need to be the executioner. The punishment will come by itself. If you're a Christian, God will settle matters. If you're a Muslim, Allah, he will punish. If you're a Buddhist, karma will deal with it. A Hindu, if they've done something bad, they have to suffer because of karma. And if you don't believe in any religion, if you believe in psychology instead, you will know for what they did to you, they will have to go through years of expensive psychotherapy. <laughs> Whatever, no one gets away with anything. So you don't need to hate somebody. Forgive. In other words, you don't actually approve of what they did. But you let it go and it becomes freedom. Hatred is not a good response. It just burns us. It creates so much emotional turmoil. Whatever someone has done, if they've done something really awful, terrible, unconscionable to you. It's their problem. Don't suffer from their misdeeds. That's really unfair. Don't take on their karma. You've got enough good <laughs> karma for yourself. So there you let it go. Okay, any other questions before we finish tonight? Yes, one more from over there. Make this a last question. Okay, you're asking what triggers the first jhana, what's the cause? To find out the answer to that, come on, is it Wednesday night? Here we go. That will be answered on Wednesday night, coming soon. Who knows what's going to happen, so please come then. <laughs> Just like when I was a kid, you used to go to the movies. You used to have this series of Batman, and at the very end, you didn't know what was going to happen next, so you had to come next week to find out. So, come next Wednesday and you'll find out what's going to happen when John is. So, thank you all for coming and thank you for those questions. May you have a wonderful night. Let's give, uh, what's it, the um, sharing of merits to all, because listening to the Dharma is one of the most wonderful things you can do. It's great merit, great good karma. Let's share the merits with all sentient beings. We're doing Idang Mei. Idam me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu yata yo. Idam me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu yata yo. Idam me nyati nang Ho tu sukita hon tu yata yo sadhu sadhu sadhu. Okay, the talk tomorrow night is letting go of letting go. That sounds a good one. And the th uh, Wednesday night is about the jhanas. And Thursday is life is not what it seems. That's interesting. And Friday, no one at home. I don't think I'll be here to give that talk. <laughs> And the last of all, Saturday the 25th, the end of the journey, enlightenment will be explained on Saturday the 25th. So please uh, tell all your friends, and even more importantly, tell your enemies because they need it more than your friends. <laughs> and I'll see you tomorrow on the next days. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>